straight politicking on all you fools out there. And I'm sitting here with Spider Loke, the most easty, and Munchie B, the mayor. And Munchie B, uh, I heard you mention this on your Rich at Heart. You had a very successful, peaceful, positive hood day. Sure did. And you know what the police always say about hood days, right? I've, I've heard police testify about hood days. They're bad. They're bad things. But talk talk briefly about uh, how, how it went. Oh, it went cold. Uh, we had uh, hoods blend that ain't blended in a long time. Because uh, back when I was younger, we used to, with the Nandu's bishops, not just single families, we used to like do our thing together. But due to allies, you know, we tight with the swans and the bebops and the bishops, tight as they is. Once the swans and the bebops wasn't really getting along no more, we just didn't do our thing with the bishops no more. But, uh, you know, this year, homies hollered beforehand, you know what I'm saying? Then we decided to run it back again, like, you know what I'm saying? The homies and the bishops. So we did it, and there was people there that, uh, I ain't seen each other in years or crossed paths on a negative note. You know what I'm saying? Everybody chopped it up. You know, the females was out. You know, it was shit. It was a, it was a success. It wasn't, you know what I'm saying? Hey, man, there's a lot of uh, unity in the streets of L.A. in the last, I don't know, a couple months. A lot of crip unity, a lot of blood unity, a lot of street unity. Unfortunately, I don't think people are talking about it at the level they need to be talking about it. Right, Spider? Well, I've seen a lot of different opposing opinions, so I guess you can't expect everybody to be in agreement. I think I think uh need to do the groundwork work first, then take it to the internet, you know what I'm saying? In case things don't go through and then it ain't it ain't really uh outsider's business and it's better to get the business done first, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, and I think people need to be a little patient or maybe not so sensitive when they hear like we're talking about it right now. We're talking about crip unity, we're talking about blood unity, and I don't see how there's anything negative about talking about our opinions on unity. I've worked on truces. I've been at the table. I've seen the struggles. I know the challenges. And why can't I speak on that? Well, I don't. I, I feel like, excuse me, um, you know, this has been, a, like you say, a large range of conversation. But in particular, it seemed like certain individuals took offense to certain things that I said in relation to the Crips in Compton. And, you know, that was shocking, surprising, astonishing, for lack of better words. But, uh, yeah, I don't understand why it would cause such irritation. And just to reiterate, not to clarify, because I was clear the first time, <laughs> I was asked if I thought that the Compton Crips were currently in a mind frame to follow suit behind the Pyrus in Compton and their expression of peace. And based on my understanding of the climate in Compton, my knowledge of things that take place, um, I said no. And I think there's no one upon the face of the earth that is familiar with the climate in Compton will be willing to pace a wager against me um, opposing that, that stand. So I don't understand how it could offend anyone. Well, I think that being pessimistic is probably offensive to some people because there's always an optimistic viewpoint on the same subject matter, right? Well, I was asked if by my co-host if I thought personally, and it was my time to express what I thought. And I know for a fact my thoughts are based on facts. It's not pessimism if it's reality. I have the most optimistic hope for the future of not only the streets of Compton, but Los Angeles, Long Beach, and the surrounding areas. But I'm not going to allow my optimism to cause me to make a statement that I know is not true. Well, you know, in, in April of 2019, I said on the Gangster Chronicles podcast that I, I envisioned the East Coasts and the Florences coming together six months before it ever happened. And people thought I was crazy for I saying that. you were that. present, so are you... <laughs> Trying to take credit to some degree? No, and when I said that- That's comedy, I'm joking. When I said that in April, I had no idea what was going, nothing had even started. The The very first conversations didn't start till August. So what caused you to feel that way? Being optimistic? Yeah, being optimistic. And I even said a possible way on, on that podcast, I said a possible way to make this happen 
is for some philanthropist that cares about the streets of L.A., that has a lot of money and that cares about peace in the streets, could possibly donate some money to the to the Florences because this is all started over money that was stolen or, or, or dope that was stolen that was worth money. That's what it all started from. And then he, fast forward to August, and boom, they're having these conversations without without any money involved. Well, I just want to, once again, reiterate, I was asked if I thought the Compton Crips were currently ready to do exactly what we saw the Pyrus do. And my answer was no, and I stand on that answer still. Okay. Hey, but even uh, to a particular person that, that uh, you know, was mad at, at the conversation we had, was gonna come at Alex sideways, but like Alex, he like one of the most optimistic people I know when it comes to that type of conversation with the with the like the treaties and shit. You know what I'm saying? Because the two particular Paru hoods, I say never about you. Be like never say never, <laughs> and you got hope for it. Well, I think that it's easier to bring two hoods together that used to really be tight, mm -hmm. as opposed to two hoods that never. from from their from their historical position have never been close. So when you get two hoods like looters and the mob that used to be like brothers. Same thing. That's something that is more attainable in my mind than something like um, maybe a Crip and a Blood set, you know, because the Crip and the Blood set, it's, oh, it's been war since day one. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not, I had members from Gray Street calling me today, alerting me to the presence of 1600 in their area, and just based on what they seen online, my name and his name, Niggas from Gray Street asking me, was it okay for him to be over there at the Watch Towers? Of course, I didn't want my name attached to no type of bullshit. So, of course, I, I, yeah, I ain't got nothing in that shit. Oh, whatever, whatever. I ain't got nothing to do with that. But who would imagine it would be some niggas from Gray Street calling me about 600 being at the Watch Towers asking me if it's cool or not. And you're saying that because there has been a, uh, some tension between the, the grapes and the East Coast is ever since uh, 08, I believe. Yes. And so when you talk about neighborhoods that used to be close, having better action and mending their differences, that's just evidence toward that, that, that speaking point. Now, the East Coasters and the grapes haven't officially ended their thing, but it's been... It's been a lot lower conflict in the last, I don't know, five, six years, right? I'll just bring back the word that you used a moment ago. I am extremely optimistic about the potential for that shit to get back right. Yeah. It's not currently there, yeah. I'm surprised that um, it's lasted as long as it did. 2008 and we're in 2024. What's that? 14 years. 14 years since that thing kicked off. You say you surprised? I'm surprised that it, within this 14 years there haven't been – well, you know what? Let me take that back because I do believe that there were some conversations at the Chuco's Justice Center in the last few years. I don't remember what year that was. But, um, yeah, I'm optimistic for that because we all know how tight the East Coasts and the Grapes were pr before 2008. There's still a lot of those relationships intact. Yeah. Not just the ones that I possess with a lot of homies. The fact that it's been going on as long as it's going on, that part wouldn't surprise me. But if it ain't been no talks, that, that's kind of surprising, like some attempts, you know what I'm saying? I don't know about anything official, but I am aware of a conversations that, but it's just like what we about to talk. The older people are having one conversation and the conversation kind of changed as you trickle down through the generations for the most part. Hey, if, if this was the 1940s right now and I told both of y'all that in the, in the next year or two, the United States is about to drop two bombs on Japan that's going to annihilate 200,000 people in the, from that population. And then if I said, and then within the next decade or so, Japan is going to forgive the United States and they're all going to be friends again. Would you believe that? Yeah, because in history, they, they, they bomb each other, and then when they get back cool, they help them build their shit back up. Yeah, but I can't even put myself in the 40s mentality <laughs> to even know if the, how ridiculous that would have sounded but, beforehand. But there are nations that don't, like Russia and the United States traditionally don't like each other. China and the United States traditionally don't like each other. You know, there are certain countries that Iran and the U.S. don't like each other. You drop two bombs on a country and you kill 200,000 people, you ain't supposed to like that country ever, right? Mm. I mean, ever. Japan and the United States are our best friends again. So I always use that as an example. If this country had two bombs dropped on them where almost a quarter million people died and they figured out how to be cool again, 
then anybody or, could be cool again. You said Japan and the United States. Yeah. So so was they was they friends before the beforehand? Like we, the, the the example we used earlier. Well, they were actually allied with Hitler and and Italy, Mussolini. So it was Hitler. It was it, it was Germany, Italy, and Japan. They were like allies. I'm saying was America ever allies with? Prior to World War II, I don't think there was there was no negative or positive. It was just two countries prior to World War II. There was no super back before before the 40s. Di diplomacy was not the way we see it now. You know, where you're flying jets to different countries, presidents are meeting at the United Nations. I don't recall what the relationship was with Japan and the U.S. in, let's say, 1910. You know, I'd, I'd have to uh, go back to the history books on that one. Yeah, that's where the comparison, uh, get a little crack in the, in the, in the, in the, in the cause they, you won't know if there was like, you know what I'm saying? Like East Coast and uh, great, there was friends and partying together yeah. at one point, you know what I'm saying? But we all know that that uh, Israel and the Arab countries that surround Israel, they hate each other probably more than any anybody else on earth. And how long every president since I was a kid has been trying to bring peace to Palestine and Israel and the surrounding Arab nations, and every president pretty much has failed. See, but see, see, uh, like you said, like Inglewood family in Rolling Sixties. I could never see that being a, a, a thing, but but you know you could uh, you could throw a spike ship and slow it down. You have people like that's you know what I mean that know each other and slow something down. But uh, like other other than that, I couldn't see it. But you got Hoover in sixties that that was hanging out together back in their days before the, the the divide. You know what I'm saying I came up where Main Street was number one ops, and now they down there homies to the homies. Like so, I've seen that full circle transition. How, what, what, how did that happen? I believe it's when they get engaged in the war with the Hoovers, it, it kind of like switched the, the whole energy. How you said that saying? A, a friend of my friend or an op of my op is my friend or something? Uh, enemy of my, a, an enemy of my, enemy is a friend of mine or something like and that. And that's all that was, in my opinion, with the Mastery, you know what I'm saying? So when they get, went up with the Hoovers, and you know what I mean, all the neighborhoods became their friends. But also, we're seeing that conflict in, in at least Los Angeles is not really something that people are engaging in like they used to because we, we live in a highly surveilled city. There's cameras everywhere. Even in our housing projects, there's cameras pretty much everywhere. There's cameras on every intersection. Certain hoods have cameras on every block, like the Fruit Town Brims by USC. You can't walk in that hood without being on camera. And it's just not making sense anymore to engage in this type of conflict unless you're a crash out dude that don't mind going to the penitentiary for the next 25 years. And I believe most people don't want to do that. True. So, so, I, you, so you said slow down? Yeah, I think in the next decade or, or so, uh, shoot, gang violence is going to be at a minimum. Hmm. I tend to agree also, at least amongst the our culture, because... I, I think we're getting it's gonna be less of us in the area. Period. That's true too. The demographic is changing, especially on the east side. The east side, man, is like sixty percent Latino. Compton is looking crucial too. It's starting to starting to look a lot um, different. Yeah. Every day, just driving around looks a lot different. I mean, that, that that's what that's what the white folks said when when, when we started moving into LA. <laughs> hey, well, 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 I was taught early on by you. Don't. Stop referring to the comments when we uh shooting, but um like two different well video they tried to throw you, throw throw a racist card on you. Is that oh because I asked about the history of blacks and Mexicans in Inglewood. See, there's no way I'm gonna interview a Latino gang member from Inglewood, and we're not talking about the Mexican black tensions in Inglewood. It goes back to the '80s, so I don't know why people uh, were so offended. But I, I don't pay the com the comments much attention because I forgot the other video. Me, you, and Spider were talking about some, and that's a recent video. Whatever it was, I, and I forget though. I, I can't remember what you what we were speaking on. But ain't nobody racist up here, bro. <laughs> nah, it's funny because some people say I'm anti Mexican, and then other days I get a a whole onslaught on pro Mexican, and that's cool. I like that because that means. 
I'm in the middle then. I mean, I don't know, I haven't seen her in a minute, but she just had a whole run collab with Angie and her whole community for the last five, six months. Yeah. Oh yeah, oh yeah, she's still, she still around. She's still Street TV. Shout out to Angie. And they got on my bumper. I, I guess I wasn't black enough. They said I was taking up for uh, for for Lefty too much and with the uh, LA Icon dude. Oh, that was that conversation with uh, when me and Spider was kind of going in on Icon. Mm -hmm. You definitely did show um, a little favor. Yeah, favoritism toward them, and you also, I think, whether it was on or off camera, told me that you weren't familiar with and y'all coming up in your area tension between y'all and the essays. You never experienced that. No, I didn't, cause uh, like the only Hispanics we we had a. It was it was nat it was quite natural automatic with the 18 streets because they was they just BK they was just pushing at it you know what I'm saying that was they think so we already know if it was 18 streets then that's what it was but we I mean yeah I, I didn't really feel no Hispanic little tension or nothing until I got to the county jail yeah. so you didn't you didn't deal with that in high school we had a culture uh, we had it was a thing every single DeMayo we had a riot with the the Mexicans yep. Oh, okay. Uh, but on the fourth, it wouldn't even be nothing. But as soon as Cinco de Mayo hit Morningside and Eagle High School, shit, we, we, it'd, rumble. it'd be a rumble. See, that's basically what I was asking Santo G is, in his era, was it like that? And that was all. I don't know. How old is he? I uh, don't, don't remember. Oh, yeah, I'm trying to see if me and him the same. 30 what? 32. Oh, okay, 32. So, so uh, you know, if... You know, teachers on every city they got a different like type of vibe or get up. You know what I'm saying? Like Long Beach, they climbing, but the racial thing is is way different. You know what yeah, I'm saying? I think it right there. It's the most yeah, it's, Long Beach and San Pedro. It was crucial. Yeah, right. that's the most tense tense areas of the county when it comes to Black Brown right now. But you go to Watts, and then you know the Grapes. They got a great relationships with the Watts Radio Grapes. It's almost like the same thing. They might be in each other kitchens eating tacos from. You know what I'm saying? They they love one another. I think the PJs too don't have some good relations with the Mexicans over there. I don't know what Mexicans is over there towards the PJs, but I think Watts in general. Is yeah, like that. yeah, yeah. Watts in general yeah. is uh, you know the Mexicans and and blacks been living in Watts since over a hundred years, so. That's the only area in our entire county that has that longevity of black brown relations. There's no other part of LA where you could say blacks and Mexicans have lived there for a hundred years together. Hmm. So they got a different dynamic over there and hopefully it stays stays positive, you know. And for those trying to blend and coexist, you might want to look to watch as a model of how it's done. You know some people from Watts. Holla at your folks and get their perspective on the subject. You know, that's a great question. I wonder if, like, the Latinos in the Valley that, like, let's say Canoga Park, Alabama, they've been known to do some anti-black things, or the Avenues, if they have relatives or family members from Watts, you know, because sometimes at the end of the day, you got family all over the place. If you don't see enough of that, then you go you go all automatically, I ain't speaking for all races, but, like, in East L.A., all they see is them, you know what I'm saying? So they ain't used to sharing schools and going to the store seeing black people and shit, so they go have that type of, you know what I'm saying? Same thing with Lefty. He from, uh, what, what what's that, SGV? Yeah, Baldwin Park. Yeah, Baldwin Park, and, and it's what percent blacks in Baldwin Park? Probably uh, five. Yeah. Five. Are you trying to justify a lack of seeing blacks for being having a disdain for them? <laughs> yeah, that's the, yeah, they not. Don't justify they, they, it? No, 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 no. Justifying is saying it is right. That's why I asked, were you attempting uh, to do so? Uh, I didn't say it was right. No, that's why I asked. Sometimes you can justify uh, your answer. Is, your answer is no. I ain't saying it's right. right. It sounds like you make. You, it sounds, you, sounds like you're providing justification. Well, when you only amongst your people, that, that's why I'm knowing the pattern. Because generally, you can find something that you encounter rarely and be over friendly and over respectful because you have an outsider and a visitor. That could be the natural energy that a human being leads with, other than being repulsed or looking for attention. So just because it's a rare encounter, to me, doesn't seem like it's a natural reason to have disdain. Yeah, I was just saying from uh, my, my standpoint, I feel that's like they reason, not saying that it's right. Just like Linux. Linux not a city, but it's a community. They not used to seeing, like, you know what I'm saying? They go be like, what you doing over here, fool? They don't like, I ain't gonna put that on all of them, but you know, they beef with blacks and tongues, you know what I'm saying? It, you know? Hey, we should be able to walk to the store or walk to the park in any community in this entire county without nobody 
tripping. Man, you should be able to do a lot of things. All right, this might offend people, right? But it's just it, it like like black people, we just more welcome and, and, and accepting than than uh say the Hispanics. You know what I mean? Even like in the county jail, if it's a black from a Mexican gang, we're not talking about he got to get out the dorm or what well, I'm saying. Got to even got to or even care. But let it be a Mexican from a black gang or or you know what I'm saying? Then it's a problem. We we ain't never like just black. We just we just welcome people. We just a real you know. And no disrespect towards the Hispanics, because everybody ain't the same. Everybody, we, we know you're not disrespecting Hispanics, bro. You no, know, but they might not know. No, 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 no. You make it clear, bro. You make it real clear. You had said nothing borderline disrespectful, my chief. Man, not at all. You, you know how this internet work. I know, but you're doing very good. All right. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the treetop, fruit town, Pyru uh, conflict that inspired the Pyru walk, YG game, and others. I think that was two weeks ago now, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. that was two weeks ago. And I had mentioned that that it, the the conflict may have went back 30 years to 1993 to Travion Logan, but I wasn't certain if it was consistent from 93 to the present. But I did find two cases between the treetops and the fruit towns from 2006. So we know that at least, was how many years ago? Was That's 18. Louisiana? Huh? Was one of them out of Louisiana chicken? I, I don't remember, okay. but there were two cases, two separate cases. Something was going on in 2006 because I found two cases where they were going up on each other. That's 18 years ago. I mean, it's been 2006. A, it's been a couple casualties back and forth. Yeah, but I was just trying to figure out um, from 1993 when Travion Logan passed uh, between, I guess, 2006. I'm not certain if the conflict lasted consistently through those years. I doubt it. Yeah, I doubt it. But we recently found out that Travion Logan is a, a relative of uh, Compton Rick Rock. Yeah, Compton Rick Rock. Shout out to Compton Rick Rock. He sent us quite a juvenile photograph for Travion, rest in peace. And he was kind of, um, he kind of appreciated the fact that his, his people's even mentioned. He said that's his blood people's. And uh, he said he's going to do a reaction to the uh, segment, if you didn't mind. Yeah, I, I've heard him say that he had a family member from Treetop that was deceased. Never heard, he never said his name, though. Mm. Um, and I guess when he heard us say Travion Logan, he was probably like, wow, that's that's my cousin. Right, right. So um, that's 93. Now, he would probably be someone that might know, even though he's not from Treetop, but he should know if it was consistent, the, the conflict was consistent from 93. Uh, but but I do know for sure, for sure, 2006, it was up, and that was 18 years ago, and that still makes that a very long beef. Right, right, compared to others. You know, I brought up the 30s and the 40s earlier, and then that was a decade. That was 10 years. Yeah, you, you mentioned the the 30s and the 40s on Rich at Heart. That was uh, the, your most recent episode, so go tap in with that, people. And I believe that started in 95 or 96 and ended in 2006. So that was a good decade. Right, right. I was at that parade when they came together, met up on King, and squashed it on King Day. Yeah, I think the worst thing that happened in that beef, someone got paralyzed, and uh, th there was quite a few shootings. I'm not, I'm not certain if anyone died in that beef. I, I don't know. That, I'm, I'm gonna be told that's crib business. So I'm gonna leave it alone. But, 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 but <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I know what you was doing I, I, watching I, the peace tree. I know. Who me? Trying to disturb, mess it up? No, nah, I don't know. My kind wouldn't even be, you know, on, on, look, look, I don't go to King Parades no more. But you know, the bloods be more closer towards oh, the mall, and then. The, the Cribs baby more towards Western. So that day they came together, whatever that chicken place called, like, you know what I'm saying? That was in the parking lot. Oh, the, the you talking about the Popeyes on King and, King and Western? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was all in that parking lot. The 40s came from this way. The hardest gonna, they, they was out there, they pieced it up and it was cool. Well, well yeah, it was cool. Well, you just happened to be at the parade. I see what you're saying. Yeah, I was at the parade, you know what I'm saying? Me being 35 and in like two months, looking back, that was a cool thing. And I do have an interview that this was talked about. I don't remember it, which interview it was, but I'll make sure to put a link in the show <laughs> notes of this episode, and I'll I'll have that interview of whoever spoke about the beef between the 30s and the 40s. I did retarded. Hey, he said, he, he said, he said, what you trying to mess it up? No, you know, I was at the parade. Yeah, I thought you was like, hey, take me up here. I heard what you were going on. With one of your little gerbs or something. Nah, I don't know. You know, it wasn't even on social media back then like that, but right. but but... I don't think nobody else knew that was gonna take place other than the thirties and the forties. You know what I'm saying? Mm. And they did that without, um, without like 
outside assistance with mm-hmm. intervention. They figured out how to fix that on their own. Even though it lasted a decade, they figured it out, and they've been cool ever since. Yeah. So shout out to the to the forties and the thirties for bringing peace back in uh oh five oh six uh, whenever it was you guys Salute did that to all peace efforts man. Right. Egos must die in order for peace to be brought about. You gotta let your egos go, y'all. No, just to get we could move on, but just to get spider up to speed, I was basically saying with the picture, what what uh somebody at the Pyro Peace Walk throwing up the middle finger with the C, the thing is it wasn't about the Crips. So if they doing some Pyro ish and that you seen that thing whatever because the 30s and the 40s they did their thing and if it was Inglewood families with the middle finger or bps with the middle finger then i mean so what that that day wasn't about us well that that moment what they had wasn't about us though so stop trying to take don't from it no key ways to project they feelings into looking at a pyro piece photograph and throw it off you got to just take that on the chin there's no need to even reacting to that part of it. Right, because I that they either told me you hating cause 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 your side ain't got it together or you just want to react to something and you just want to be hurt. And then some people, everybody is not just sound thinking as we may consider ourselves. Some people may be offended by things that are not necessarily um should be offensive. Some people are just more sensitive than others. Mm-hmm. And it's, it, it, it speaks a lot to the ignorance that attends game banging a lot. We get on these platforms and we discuss it from some, such an intellectual perspective and we kind of like lose sight of a lot of ignorance that be involved in this a lot of times. But game banging is an ignorant sport. That's you know, my so, point. So, so I ain't, ain't going to go cap even though That's you took part, but for, for you to look at a, a picture from a Pyro Peace March and be mad, even if you've seen a shirt, with some disrespect or somebody throwing up a disrespectful game sign, that's dumb. I, I I didn't quite get that. I mean, you could consider it dumb, but niggas go dumb for they set. So I understand the ignorance. Even though it is ignorance, I get it. I'm not that surprised that some hmm. Crips said something about seeing the F, the, you feel me? I'm not surprised at all. All right. Hey, as a photographer, what I usually do in those situations, I let them do their thing, and then I say, hey, can we get a, a picture where – with no signs, no no gang signs, none of that, and then that's the picture that I'll use. <laughs> you know what I mean? It happened even with homies because they want to send pictures to the joint. Well, you, if you want to send them to the joint, you got to do it without the signs. That's what I'm saying. We yeah. chunk them up, then they be like, no signs, no signs, yeah. no signs, because you're gonna take some more. Yeah, but a photographer didn't take that. That was just a, a picture that went viral because when a rapper in there, and then I think this particular person just wanted to find something wrong and say. I, I remember Big Payback was my artist, and he shot a video that I paid for, and when I got the final cut, no, I didn't get it. When it got uploaded, everybody called me like, hey, I thought it was your artist, SPI. I'm like, it is, what's happening? He shot a video, everybody chunking up neighborhood in the video. So I go look at it, I'm like, damn. So I called Payback, I'm like, cuz, what's woo woo? He like, oh man, after the uh, editor started editing the video, he said if he cut all of that out, I ain't gonna have no video left. So he put the video out anyway instead of doing a reshoot, but it was hella eye busters in it, bro. Hey, but but go back to that video. Uh, what Nipsey uh, video uh, RSC to the day that I die. I'm gonna be from RSC to the day that I die. Uh, I believe, big, you went back and then you know all the graffiti that was on the wall that might have been some disrespectful whackouts. He uh, either like edited it out or blurt it out or something because he wanted it to, you know, everybody to mess with the song, you know what I'm saying? So that's different. That's just some some music shit versus, cause he trying to sell some music. So that that's different. So I see why he did that. Other than that. Hey, you gotta try to be re- as respectful as possible. I got a lot of flack for letting a big stretch from Fruit Town Brim say uh, crab quite a few times. and. W- I couldn't edit it out. In fact, I edited it out as many times that he said that word as I could. But YouTube uh, uh, audience, am I supposed to be offended the way he just said that? I just want y'all because y'all know hey, how they do on these platforms. Let me tell you something. All right, did you you, you didn't get you got way more blowback? I'm not from him y'all. saying that Thanks word, bro. Versus when he was talking about the BL thing. I got. I think I got pushed back more on when he talked about the prison politics. Yeah, because I was getting phone calls. Yeah, he went crazy on that. But I, I got a little bit of internet hate for letting him say that so many times. What what they didn't see is the editing of 
hey, can you can you um bleep it out when he said it there? Okay, can mm. we bleep it out there? All right, can, can we bleep that one out? No, nah, we can't bleep that one out because that's in the middle of an important sentence. Okay. All right, we'll keep that one. How about this one? All right, we can get that one. So I did my best <laughs> to try to bleep out as many derogatory terms as he said. As, as But at the end of the day, I think three or four of them still got in there. Okay, so, so do that have anything uh, to do with your reasoning for telling X file to stop this and Hoover because you thought back to that? I did, actually. I did. Mm. And it's something that I try to tell everybody to do in the beginning of the interview. I say, can, if we can limit the amount of dissing, disrespecting the enemies, I would appreciate it. And sometimes people respect it, and sometimes you get a, a rea reaction like X foe. <laughs> F all that. You know? <laughs> culture. Hey, 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 culture hey, hey, bro. Hey, 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 oh, 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 but you want me to nice it up? Yeah. Nice it up? <laughs> yeah. And I would think he would understand because he's a musician. He's an artist, and, and he, he should be getting this. Family from the other side. And, and I'm sure that whoever is his advisors that is helping him with his career are telling him the same exact thing. But he well, covering know, at that point, he was so raw, and we kind of familiar with his advisors, so he probably wasn't getting all the best game. He might be polished up better by now, though. Yeah. It's been about a year and a half. He so. don't do too many interviews, though. I think I ran, recently ran across one. That was more the way of the artists of the past. So if he's looking to create his artistry in a more traditional way and keep that exclusivity, that's probably wise. It's more of a more common thing for artists to be in everybody's face all the time. And then going back to your boy Big Payback, rest in peace, he wanted to do an interview with me where he was dissing people by name. I said, Payback, I, I understand you're upset. Let's try to keep the, 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 these people's names out of the video, but you can just express your frustration of what's going on in the hood. And he said, okay. But then he went back to his channel. He did a whole different video, name and names, name and names. before he passed. <laughs> and uh, I try to tell him, this is not the way you want to go. You a rapper. You an artist. Let's just say, hey, I'm upset what's going on with, with, in my hood, X, Y, Z, but let's not name people. And uh, he ended up naming people on his own platform. And I don't know if that's connected to what happened to him. but Me either, but I do know he was living a life where he was getting bullet holes in his car, getting them fixed, swapping the car, house being shot up. He was swap coming, trying to swap guns out with me on a consistent basis. And it was just up for his life. Whatever it was, I didn't know the exact politic. I think some of it was with his own homies, but he just had a lot of activity going on in his life that wasn't peaceful. Rest and, in peace, payback. Yeah, rest in peace, payback. And it's ironic, he, he he comes up out of an area that traditionally does not have a lot of violence and crime, but for whatever reason, it was up in his life. But him what and you his mean? personal- North Hollywood. Experience from North Hollywood. Let me know that that element exists out there, and I know for a fact, payback then left North Hollywood and went, all the way off to 110, all the way in our area, and got cracking before too. Yeah. Um. Hey. Uh, hey. Look. It's, uh, it go up everywhere. So I don't know. I know. The, I know the West is. You know. They got the two P B, the liquor streets. You know. Saying the Mexicans. So I don't know. Well, <laughs> if you do a map of violent crime in L A County, comparing comparing contrast, type I'm thing? gonna say that about seventy percent of the violent crime is in one police division. In L.A. 77. You know, 77. I, I understand exactly what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. But I understand what he's trying to make sure it doesn't seem like you're saying because you can trigger a whole lot of people. There's a debate going on with two homies right now online because of similar statements made like this. Look, I'm a social scientist. You know, I look at the data. I look at the numbers. And it ain't no disrespect to people in the San Fernando Valley. But at the end of the day, they have about 10 percent, 15 percent of the violence that happens in the entire city. And a majority of the violence in our city happens in 77 Division. And then the second most violent section is the Southeast Division, where I believe... The Harlem's. No, it's Southeast the is the East Side. It's the East Side. Southeast. It's Watts. Southeast it's it's your section. 108. 108th? Yes, 108th Station. Yeah. Um, all of Watts, all of the projects, that's Southeast. Oh, so the, the Linwood shit, too. Yeah. All that. So, so you confused me with the Southeast thing, because uh, the that one that, that police station, I think, is on King. It's called South something. That's called too. Southwest. Southwest. There so you go. got Southwest Division, you got Southeast Division. Southwest is, is in the top six or seven, but it's 77 is the monster. Don't nobody yeah. call it Southeast, though. It's 108th on Station. That's why I was confused. Yeah. Okay. But um, he's a social scientist, sir. 
So I'm just looking at. They didn't say uh, nothing about geography, southeast, and all this shit. Social science. Uh, I'm just looking at the raw numbers. You know, you look at the raw numbers. Data. Yeah, 77 division will have the number one homicides every single year. They cover a lot of ground, though. Well, the, most of the, these divisions are designed to to have about the same population. They can't. Well, they do. They that's what it's designed to do. No, nah, they designed but seven seven. Yeah, that's why we have um, a new a new division got carved in the valley called Mission. Um, right now, where we're at, where we're at right now is an, we're, no, we're in a new division that used to be a different division. Oh. So they carve it out because they want to balance it to make sure that the the populations are equal in the divisions. If you get too many people in this one division, they're going to cut it in half. Is, is this like a competitive thing that you don't want the most cracking area to be, not your area? Who? Munchie. Oh. One more time? Oh, you just don't want to hear that the most cracking area is on the east side? Mm, no, nah, hell no. Nah. I just think 7-7 uh, seven, seven division, I think they cover more ground than the other departments. Well, it's, it's, it's usually about population, and there's about 200,000 people in each division. So 7-7 seven, seven go away to the swans, don't they? Yeah, it goes all the way to Broadway. Yeah. Okay. okay. Then you got they in the sixties, and then they they and the not they just they all over the place. That's what I'm saying. They, they it's other departments that cover the ground. That I mean, I could, I can give you the square miles of seventy seven division, mm -hmm. and it's usually about the same. But uh, here's an interesting thing. Guess which division has the most gangs in it? Mm. The most gangs, and it ain't seventy seven. <laughs> got got to be hundred eight then. No, there's a, there's a division on the east side called Newton. That's what you said. Oh, you said Newton? Yeah. Okay, I didn't hear you. Newton has the most gangs in any division. Hmm. And, and who they who they police? Um, they got 38th Street, the Outlaws. It's the low bottoms from mm -hmm. from like Washington, um, Adams. Uh, who else? You got the Faux Trays over there. You got the Faux Deuces, Faux Eight, the Four Pack. You got there's some. I believe there's some. I think the Six Pack. No, no, Six Packs might not be in in. In uh, Newton Division, but Newton Division, it's because they got a bunch of Mexican gangs over there, and That's they got small though, and they got a bunch of tiny Mexican gangs that right. have like two blocks. So when you count all the sets over there, they got a um, 41st Street and all that. Yeah, they got uh, uh, Primera Flats, 23rd Street. They got Locos Park. They got Ghetto Boys. Um, so you know, they mm -hmm. got they got the most gangs on the map, um, Newton Division. But uh, let me move on to a, a fact check from uh, I believe this would have been last week. Munchie, I don't know how Suge came up and courts came up. You said oh, he don't have no luck in the court system anyway. I said criminal or civil. Yeah, criminal or civil. But he he won one of his most important cases when it comes to finances. It's that Terry Carter lawsuit that he was looking at eighty one million dollars to pay. That case is done with. It's over with, and he don't have any financial obligation to the to the Carter family. They didn't refile. The first trial ended up in a hung jury. There was an agreement. They had a certain amount of days to file the second trial, and for whatever reason, they never filed the second trial. So that means it is over, and he don't have to pay eighty million dollars. Hmm. And I knew that was going to be a big problem. We we know he we was never going to pay it, but that impacts. His income, if he's going to make 10000 a week on a podcast or if he's going to make a, a, a million dollars on a movie, guess what? That w that money would have got diverted. Right. So uh, he won that uh, $81 million uh, lawsuit. Hmm. But, yeah, he's he's lost quite a few cases, though. He got, he, he got one victory. <laughs> yeah, he, he got – well, I don't know if he's only got one. I didn't even know he was up against that. What, the uh, the civil yeah. suit? The yeah. yeah, the Carter family was, was coming after him. A wrongful death? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know they got he they got he got a lot of kids, mm. Terry Carter, and then his wife was named in the lawsuit, and the kids were so. Um, Terry Carter tried to play buy a beautiful world for me, man. Offered me some chump change. <laughs> Rest in peace, Terry Carter. But Papa Smurf, I don't know if Papa Smurf was in on the deal trying to swindle me, but he made the connection, and we went and met him over there at his office, right where Hartthorn turns into La Brea. He used to have an office right back there, and uh. He offered me the little chump change for the song. I'm like, man, what you gonna do with it? And he was like, don't worry about it. Once I, once I, once it's mine, it's mine. You ain't gotta worry about it. I'm gonna do with it. But it was some of the most jankiest negotiations I've been involved in with a, a record exec. Rest in peace, Terry Carter. Did you try to negotiate that? Um, can I get like two percent back, three percent back, five percent something? I'm not gonna lie. Um, I was more interested in the bigger front end that I tried to negotiate, and he wasn't willing to budge. 
the conversation they didn't even get to the back end because he wasn't even really forthcoming with his plans or anything. I didn't, so we didn't, didn't go that further. We didn't even take a second meeting on it. Okay. Yeah, man, that's like that uh, ghetto negotiations, huh? My <laughs> office hours are from nine to five. <laughs> Rest in peace to bro. Rest in peace. Heavyweight. And uh, I'm going to go on the record and say that that was an accident that Suge did that to him. I would imagine so. There was nothing deliberate, no malicious intentions. Uh, he was just trying to get out of there. That was it. And um, it's, if you look at the video, it's kind of weird. Terry kind of, he he kind of moves in the direction that Suge's going in. And, and by the time he sees the truck, it's too late. And yeah, it was, it was uh, man. Extremely that, unfortunate. Yeah, it was, it was bizarre, man. I remember Bone told me after he got ran over, he's on the ground and he's like sideways and he's looking at Terry on the ground. I heard somebody recorded him on the phone telling that story. It's up on YouTube somewhere. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's uh, That dude secretly recorded him. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we ain't going to go into that dude. But, um, yeah, man, Suge, Suge, did, Suge did win this case. And it, it it was an important case because it was a financial a, a huge financial debt that he would have had to somehow slither out of you know if he would have had to do all of this well let me let me get my wife to be the person that makes the money on this podcast or this movie and then the Carter family would have to come you know there's ways you oh, okay we're gonna go after the wife then or we're gonna go after this person right it would have been just a mess but um, hey he he got out of that so basically he won that case. Yeah, they wasn't gonna see no money from him. No, nah, they wasn't. Just like OJ, um, they, they didn't get no money from OJ. No. That, but he, hey, OJ had to uh, dodge things and and do things certain kind of way. Move, move to a whole other state. Yep. Yeah, yeah, to, to to get out of that thirty three million dollar debt. OJ, OJ, OJ had a good advisor. Similar to what we uh, we discussed, game perhaps was having to do with the Priscilla thing and. Got kind of complicated for him. Well, here's the thing. California does not protect your houses. That's why OJ moved. Mm. He didn't want to lose his mansion, so he sold it and then bought a mansion in Florida. That And under Florida law, it's protected. Mm. So if game is smart, sell the house that you got now. Go buy a house out of state. You don't got to live in Calabasas. You don't got to live in in uh, Santa Clarita. You don't got to live in California. If you had a house in his name already, it would have been it would have been gone. But technically, I could live in your home any as long as you allow me, right? Yeah. So I mean, with that type of move, it, it could live anybody, you know, anybody close enough to Yeah, he could he could sell the house to a family member, you know, the, if it's in his name. Right, right. But, you know, there's the court systems are getting smarter and smarter and they're not allowing people to try to circumvent their obligations just because you put this car in someone's name. And, you know, the, there's ways that it's going to be harder and harder to do that. You got to do what OJ did. All right, I'm leaving California. I'm going to live in Florida and uh, my house is protected. Yeah, I'm out of here. I don't need these du dudes uh, breathing down my neck every day. Right. Makes you know? sense. And I know how that is. I was in a bankruptcy case once and Man, these people came out of the woodworks to that court date and be like, Mr. Alonzo owes us this. Another person, Mr. Alonzo owes us that. I'm like, damn. damn. You know, they're coming for their money. So uh, I, I see why OJ did what, uh, what he did. Uh, I think that was a smart move. All right. Um, we talked about the definition of culture vulture and spider. You went into the literal, literal actions of what vultures do. In their habitat. And you... You put that into the definition to a certain degree. I looked up a few definitions, and I want to read them. Uh, some of them uh, are from different dictionaries. This one is from Urban Dictionary. It says here, a culture vulture is someone who steals traits, language, or fashion from another ethnic or social group in order to create their own identity. Hmm. Here's another one. One who appropriates the art, creativity, and style of others most often for their own benefit and at, and at worst in a way that serves no value to the originators of what cultural product, tradition, or practice was lifted from. Um, here, let me read it one more. A culture vulture is a person who adopts something from a different community and makes it their own. And do you see similarities or differences from how you said it uh, last week? Uh, similarities, differences as well. I, my... Definition was a lot more aggressive. 
to him because I assumed that, um, like you said, I, I took the natural meaning and I actually consider, you know, not just what they took, but what they left for those that they were taken from. And so that got into the my definition because I figured like a vulture, someone that came and partook with our culture, but did not necessarily take and not give would not necessarily be considered a vulture. You know what I'm saying? Here, there's one more here I'll read. This is the last definition. A person or organization making profit using unhonorable practices from a culture they do not care for. That's pretty. A lot of people would think that's the American uh, industry of. uh, That's the record business. That's the history of the record business. Definitely the history of the record business. From the onset, I'm understanding that white people getting off a subway saw black performers and getting money put into hats and they upscaled the whole concept from there and that's how the industry was uh, born hey have the the jews been involved in the record business even back to the like the 30s and 40s and 50s when record producing started or is that a more modern business practice but a self-censored word since you're so bold was jew that's when i left out oh, okay. i was told there was like jews stepping off the trains seeing the black singing and harmonizing and saw people put money in and they saw the vision and started, hey, what if I gave you this? Would you sing those songs for me and let me own them? And that's where it began. So I could be wrong when I say it was Jews, but I thought that's what the story was. No, I seen a couple documentaries where, you know, some of the Jews were hanging out with, with the jazz performers from the clubs and then inviting them to come record and then mm. basically stealing their music, stealing their their lyrics and making I don't know at that time what they were making, but a whole lot more money than they were making. And that has seemed to be the uh, the model ever since. And we're talking about, uh, I've seen documentaries that depict this going on in the 40s with some of the uh, first black entertainers. We see it at least as far back as the uh, Five Heartbeat movies and The Temptations, so we know it didn't start there. And that had to be, what, the 50s? Yeah, that would either the 50s or the 60s. But, yeah, yeah. Um, I think that word just get, get used to it loosely. But now that the internet, most words seem like they get oversaturated. But I didn't mean to bring this up, didn't plan on it. But with this subject matter in the air, it, either you happen to see my recent appearance and leaving of, of American Cholo podcast. I did see that. I did see that. And um, But you walked, you came back though. You left and came back yeah, a couple I, minutes yeah, later. I, I, I didn't leave as far as to leave. I removed myself from being next to a a source of irritation that was developing and I didn't want to lose control of whatever may happen. I just feel like that was the best thing to do. But I just sat across and cooled off and just let things, it wasn't not, I didn't leave the premises or anything. But he was touching me at the time. He said the word dick. I was not understanding. <laughs> Tapping you with some shit? Like, calm, like, calm down. Like, But resting his hand on my wrist. And said the D-I-C-K word. Yeah, like how now I've seen Brick Baby and Adam and Lush One react to it. And I get he was like, they went to like, oh, you dick, like the regular. But that's not something I'm really familiar with. They, they was trying to make the dick sound like, oh, you fucker, how mess can say it. But at the time he said dick, bro, it was so out of nowhere. And the irritation was already built. And then to have like this clammy, warm, kind of, soft kind of firm grip on my wrist camera zone i just was extremely uncomfortable but it was all about the subject matter of culture vulture in general hmm. yeah yeah uh I, I saw the back and forth and i don't think you 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 really get anywhere in these types of back and forth when you have someone as stubborn as you and as stubborn as him it's almost pointless to even i mean it's if it's content it's content right Turn- no, I'm not there for content. I was there for a <laughs> uh, healthy um, dialogue. However, I think you know how I practice. You have tried to teach me on my own platform, 60-40 to the guests. I went in there thinking myself, 20-80, 20 me speaking. So stubborn or not, there was nothing he expressed that I disagree with to show any stubbornness. I just was not allowed to express myself. I didn't. I wasn't stubborn toward anything he said. He said they uh, were intimidated by uh, blacks because they were BBGs, big black guys. I didn't debate that with him. I didn't argue with him. Um, My only issue was him saying that the way um, we view tacos as Mexican food, that that didn't translate 
to hip hop being our thing. No matter mm-hmm. who does it, like, okay, do you think my tacos are Mexican food? Yeah, it fall under that. That's what I'm saying. He trying to bring up Taco Bell, like, okay, if it's still ours, does Taco Bell Mexican? No, but on the wall it says Mexican food. If you look at the paper, everything says Mexican food. So it's just an acknowledgement. I like black tacos better than the traditional Mexican taco. Okay, but if it ain't Mexican food, why well, have a dog that says you ghetto Taco Bell? That's my point. My- a, ch- a chihuahua, which is a Mexican dog. So, so yeah. That's what I'm saying. No matter who makes the taco, we all agree we're making Mexican food. But when it comes to rap music, all of a sudden, who's performing it, it changes the origin of whose it is. And I think I don't think that's fair because when you go from the older Latinos, they loved R and B oldies. They listened to them. They they respected our culture. They accepted it, and that was it. You never heard a debate was this black music or not. But now that the Latinos have gotten younger, it's the same practice, same tradition of Chicanos appreciating our musical renditions. But now it's a debate as to whose culture it is. Oh, see, I never heard the debate. I think part of the debate I, 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 is, is, is is they walk them in with how they eat like. Well, there's a debate that has nothing to do with Mexicans, but it has to do with Puerto Ricans on whether or not they were there day one of hip hop and participated in it. That's a different debate, and maybe they're trying to piggyback off of that. I think it probably is a, a, a bleeding a, a conversation that bled over because um you know. We, I think most people agree that hip hop and rap started in the Bronx. Well, who was living in the Bronx in the 1970s? It was black and Puerto Ricans. Um, and were Puerto Ricans there? They absolutely were. Uh, were they a part of it in the beginning? Absolutely. Um, so are they Latino? Yeah. So maybe maybe that somehow that the, the West Coast Mexicans are trying to say, hey, we, we got a stake in hip hop too. Even though Puerto Ricans and Mexicans aren't even related to each other in any you know, culturally, they're not related. I, the only thing they got in common is they speak the same language. I, I just don't I don't care for the culture virtual word culture vulture word, cause um if I got the bread to buy a soccer team, you no, know, they ain't typically no black right, or sport. I'ma buy me a, a soccer team. Like so what I'm gonna be a culture vulture too? Well, you got you. You're gonna definitely get some criticism. Oh, you have to deal with that. I'm doing, I'm doing what any Puerto smart Rican? person go do. I'm gonna go where the money at. I figured that. What was that, Spider? Don't you have some Puerto Rican descent, blood? And yeah, lineage? yeah, I do. I was just curious. I mean, I knew that from a long time ago. It wasn't in front of my mind, but when you spoke about your perspective as far as hip hop, and I, I was reminded of your lineage. But see, a lot of people use the word "create." Who created hip hop? I don't know who created hip hop because really? hip hop wasn't really created. It was something that developed, formed, and evolved into what it became. No, it wasn't created, it was born. And it was born in the Bronx. And whether it was born or created, I think any logical mind can agree since its inception has been a black thing. Well, who was, who was the first DJ? I cannot recall. So I'm saying. I would say Cool Herc, but, so, but Cool Herc has is, is got Jamaican roots. So it's a, here's the question Jamaican is black. Well, so is Puerto Rican. But what a lot of people are saying, it's a black American thing, the, uh, the FBA term. Foundational black Americans don't include Jamaicans. Foundational black Americans don't include people from Trinidad, Tobago, Puerto Rico, Cuba, Dominican Republic. So that was the debate when it comes to hip hop. Who else used that That's FBA what, term other than the boy? What's his name? Tariq Nasheed. Who else used that term other than him? Well, I guess who, he created it. Right? He inspired. Yeah, people who follow. And then ADOS is another term that's similar to FBA. ADOS is. I think he used to adhere to that term. American descendants of slaves. So American descendants of slaves excludes Jamaicans, Dominicans, Puerto Ricans. But blacks were rapping before hip hop. If you're talking about rhyming and telling a story in a rhythmic, melodic way. Definitely. So it wasn't the inception of hip hop that brought on rap. And I think when we talk about hip hop in its current form, I think people are more talking about rapping. But I agree that um, the guy that's the first modern rapper, Coke Rock, he's a brother. Okay. He's a black American. He gets that. That's his stamp. Um, but when it comes to DJing, a lot of these DJs had family from the Caribbean. They weren't black Americans. So I think in the beginning, I would say majority of the dudes were black Americans, but you can't discount the black Caribbeans that were on the streets of the Bronx at the same time. Well, on the streets of the Bronx, 
in its most rawest, purest form, you may be correct. But the version of hip hop that went forth to the world was a black thing. Well, what is hip hop? There's elements. Or rap. I'm gonna go okay, back to okay, rap. rap. Hip hop is elements. Yeah. And I'm, I, I, I believe the debate gets lost with a lot of people, black people. I don't think they're talking about spray painting and, and scratching and mixing and break dancing. And I don't think they even care to debate that. I think they talking about spitting. Yeah, just spitting. If it's just yeah. spitting. But even in the beginning of hip hop, spitting was secondary. It was the DJ that was doing the party that was the main I'm attraction. Of I'm aware of that. However, the most premier element that got everybody's attention over the long run was the MC. Yeah, almost every all the other elements kind of fell right off now. correct uh, even in the 80s most rap groups had djs like yes. kid and play yes. um de la soul nobody has a I dj now the mc was birthed to hold down the dj the dj was the one that rocked the party he don't have to show up with his craze build up and he started implementing mcs to accentuate his show his set but you know which dj is that today mm. Colin. Mm. dude don't rap he don't sing Right. You know, but there's very few DJs that are just DJs. Everybody got DJs these days. Uh, also, you got to it. you got to throw in dude from um, Pusha Ink. Mustard. Mu mustard. Mustard. Oh, I didn't know where he's from. Well, I don't even think that's a thing anymore. He's but more of a he's more of a producer too, though. He he don't he make beats because I think Kelly just like does the Dr. Dre as some. I mean the Quincy Jones. Yeah, but they're primarily DJs that have made it. Khalid, Mustard, and there might be a few that I'm, I'm missing, but for the Drama. most part. For the most part, the DJ is not as relevant as he used to be. No, no, you're right. Because even I realize at the radio station, the DJ is nobody. <laughs> They're not. Yeah. The program director makes a decision. You learn that by trying to get DJs to do things, and they tell you they only have a small amount of room to wiggle. And and the only reason why I bring all this up, I'm wondering if if Mexicans are trying to attach themselves to the Caribbean Latinos that were there when hip hop and rap started, to try to put themselves into the history of it. Well, that's why I said Latinos because I've been overeducated through the comments. I think he told him told me himself he's not Mexican, uh, American Cholo. And I'm only reacting to the conversation I had with one individual. I'm not speaking on behalf of the perspective of Mexicans in general. It was the dialogue that he and I was having where I didn't think, I think that's what he was trying to say, that it, it didn't, we had no state claim or nothing. It was just a generic thing that anybody can uh, claim to have been a part of or there's no cultural significance to black people in rap is the position I was taking from him as an individual. Now you definitely got to give rap to to black people been rapping before hip hop and there's there's quite a lot of evidence to support that. So you got to give it to, to black folks and, and that's what it is. Black Americans to, to be specific. And even like art forms like jazz, jazz was created by blacks in the United States of America. You know, one of one of my favorite musical art forms, uh, R and B. You know, it's just so many art forms. And yet, and still, Kenny G is <laughs> one of the most contemporary, premier names for jazz. So you will have some white folks who probably weren't quite educated argue you down. Yeah. Well, you know, there was a time when the when the West Coast jazz came out in the. I want to say the 60s or 70s, and the rest of America did not accept West Coast jazz. They was like, that's a knockoff, because one of the, the the top groups was the David Brubeck Quartet, White Boys. <laughs> I think it was the, was it, I'm saying his name right, the David Brubeck Quartet. They did have a couple of hits, though, but, yeah. well, you know, white guys doing jazz. I've seen a clip floating around on Facebook. I think it's Frankie Lyman, but it was the first time he performed his hit song in public and the white females in the crowd realized he was black and it just showed all the all shock and disappointment in their face. I guess the radio had been, the record had been spinning on radio and they've been playing, they loving it and they come to see him live and this black dude out here singing his song and they was just All right, I got a trivia. Shocked. I got a trivia question for you. Who's the first rapper or rap group to go platinum? Ron DMC. I saw Beastie Boys, mm, that's what makes White sense. Boys, see, yeah, see, they sold five million records of that. Um, they had a couple of bangers on that album, Rock though. Rock I gotta admit, and all that. I remember yeah, that. <laughs> they had a couple of bangers. They had, they definitely had a couple of bangers. They were the Eminem before Eminem, right? You know, right. Um, but all right, um, we got to move on to. Um, then there was Vanilla Ice. 
Yeah, Vanilla, he he ended up doing like 15, 20 million records. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Uh, MC Hammer did 10 million off of that bunk album, but he had some hits. No was, disrespect. Was it that wasn't our type. Is it disrespectful that I just called that album bunk? Yeah, it yeah, was. Because you it was. Yeah. Uh, I'm a rap bunk and then go say her hits on it. Yeah. So well, I, I mean, the hits like too legit, too legit that to wasn't quit. Bunk for that time. I thought it was bunk in live. Live, I thought it was bunk. In fact, I have a picture. I had the two, the MC Hammer album in my bedroom on as, on the dartboard, and I used to throw darts on it. Well, I'm not <laughs> saying that that was my type of music, but I can remember. That being a song that come on the radio or being on TV somewhere, and I bob to it. Yeah. I mean, it had some hits, but I thought it was bunk. Uh, you said you threw darts at his album? Yeah. Man, MC Hammer go whoop your ass. Yeah, man. man. You knew that shit was hard when he was, uh, <laughs> ain't that when he came out the hotel room and looked down and said something? He like, he had one hard part in the video. I forget. I'm tired. Yeah, I, I knew I wasn't tripping. I had a hoodie on when I got here. I had to come out that thing. Oh, yeah, but but right. he, he did 10 million on that record. I want believe that. I want you think he still did he think he had a proper deal? One of them deals we claim we, we complain about. I don't know, but he ended up filing bankruptcy uh, some years after. So it's like the TLC story a little bit. Yeah. All right. Um, no disrespect to you, MC Hammer. I, I, oh, no. I apologize. Yo, fade. I apologize for calling your album bunk. But dude, 1989, I was a teenager. I just wasn't feeling it. Yeah. You know? That's when we was like on our thuggery a little bit. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um I wanted to talk about this comment that I made last week, and we got a clip that we're going to play so I could explain what I meant by the comment. But last week when we was talking about the Black Sam interview, I said something about I was I was cool with both of them, uh, Nipsey and Big U. But when they had their clash, you had to pick a side. Now, I wasn't saying that I specifically picked the side, mm. but everybody assumed I picked the side and I must have picked the big U side. Never did I pick uh, a side. What I meant by that was if you're from over there, if you were in that section, which I'm not from, you picked the side. And I want to play a clip to where this actually came from. It is the uh, I interviewed Jermaine Williams, who is Loose Cannon's identical twin brother, and he talked about how Loose Cannon ended up picking the side. At that time, he was in Big U's camp. And that's, I, I guess he, he did a song with Nip and then ended up hanging out with Big U and picked the side. And that's where this thing c comes from. Uh, play the uh, Jermaine Williams clip, please. So uh, I interviewed Jermaine Williams, the identical twin of Loose Cannon. And this is what he had to say about what was going on back then. You found out about Nip getting shot before your brother did. Of course. Okay. Yeah, I did. And then you called him up and told him. Yeah. See what what I what what I'm getting because I talked to my cousin. My cousin has a. She has a. What she said. She said she talked to uh, her uh, her baby daddy Nip thirty minutes before. Uh, he got shot. You talking about China? China. Okay. She has she has that. Some, she said it was on a podcast or, or interview. So you should be able to look that up. And I guess that's where my brother got that story from. Okay. And I also know that your brother didn't even have Nipsey's phone number at that time. Mm -hmm. Now they may have done a song together back in 2011, I think that was, yeah. which would have been bringing like- Bringing California back, yeah. Bringing California back, which was like eight years before. Mm -hmm. But in 2019, according to Gigi, mm -hmm. and then according to Spider, mm -hmm. they weren't even in communications with each other. Or do you know of any sort of connection between your brother and Nipsey in 2019? No, nah, I mean, the, the thing is, it was an issue in Hood. So people had to pick sides on uh, if they was going to go on one side or the other side. He chose the other side. So they didn't have no communication like that because of the side that uh, he chose. And he chose. I think this is all public. Everyone's talked about it. You talking about when, when Nip and Big U got into it in 2011 over there at the uh, at the parking lot. It was hood business. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, it's hood business, but everybody already done covered it. And at that time, your brother was cool with Big U. Mm -hmm. And that All means right, that he good. wasn't communicating. Okay, so this whole thing about taking a side, it comes from this interview I did with Jermaine. So when I said you had to take a side, you know, he was schooling me on people took sides. 
Alex Alonso never took a side in this situation because I'm not from over there. I didn't grow up over there. It wasn't my choice. And I'm not even sure if everybody from the section took a side, but obviously there were sides being taken. And that's all. I, that was the only point I was trying to make. I tend to agree with you. I, I know some division amongst the issue, but I think it was people that set it out as well. Yeah. And I think, um, Munchie, you made a comment about kicking him when he was down, literally, and, and people completely twisted your the meaning that you wanted to people to gather from that statement. And they made it seem like you was present dur during the assault against Draco because you said kicking him when, in, when he's down. But I knew you meant the, the figure of speech, kicking someone when they're down. Right. You know, so... Nah, I never, I never took a side in that at all. I'm not, I'm not from over there. I'm not from that section. And let me just, uh, before we move on, I just want to also stress and articulate, me and Nipsey never had a physical fight, ever. Nipsey never touched me. He never hit me. He never punched me. I certainly never got a wedgie or uh, whatever else people are saying that Nipsey did to me. That never happened at all. In fact, um, I, I've had a, a picture of Nipsey hanging up on this wall for, for many years. In fact, hey, Safir, grab, do me a favor. Grab that, um, there's a, yeah, grab that for me real quick. You know, I've had this hanging up over here for, you know, on and off for, for years. I've been wondering what happened to it. You know, and, you know, I, I had about 200 copies of this thing. And I used to keep it on that. Remember that table I used to have in here? Most, most certainly do. Okay, I had that table. I used to keep copies of this on the table and give them away of this um, of this final call with Nipsey on the cover. And then when I started getting low, my when it got down to about twenty, I was like, you know what? I, I don't. I'm gonna stop giving these away. So I probably have maybe fifteen of these final calls with Nipsey on them that I cherish. You know, um, I'm, I'm not doing anything with the last ones that I have and I even got the signed remember the his um his DVD or CD that he was selling for $100 I don't know what year that was but I went I ended up getting a signed copy of that from Nip so now nah, I had no hate for Nip it, it was there's nothing negative between me and Nip we had one interaction that you can say was negative it lasted 30 seconds and then that was it it was over and done with and that's, that's, right. that's all I really got to say on that's that. That's some peace to the homie, neighborhood nip. Hey, hey I'm going to fact check myself, right? Because um, I'll be saying, uh, you know, some red red dot, blue dot thing. And, and Nipsey and YG, they do their thing. And I'm like, I ain't impressed because, you know, they ain't the media enemies. Yeah. Uh, I'd be more impressed if he did a song with, like, uh, Schoolboy Q. He did do one. He did the Joe Moses one, didn't he? Yeah, but see, already, look, look, look okay. Uh, he, got a pro he had a project called Gang Injunction. It don't ever get talked about, but he had a gang of people on that project, and he got a song with Schoolboy Q on there. So that's a fact check with me, because I just said that a couple times, you know what I'm saying? Okay. Yeah. And who was, oh, well, what's his name? His brother, uh, Lewis Cannon brother? Jermaine Williams. That hood business shit, is, that's laughable, bro. I mean, it is hood business, but because we got the internet now and everybody's of, reacting. He, man, like. You got to let him have that, bro. He ain't made no splash talking to a whole bunch of street business on the internet. Actually, actually Nipsey did, was in a documentary where he, he's in the parking lot and he, he's telling whoever the camera person is. He was like, my brother was standing right here. The LAPD came right here and was shooting at my brother but, and, and he missed my brother. So he was talking I about mean, it. him as an individual. Doesn't obligate him to want to discuss it on just because others have. Yeah, it doesn't mean he has. No, you're right. No, you're right. Yeah. yeah, the fact that he said hood business. <laughs> nah, I, I, what does that I, mean? It mean it mean a lot. I'm trying to understand. A lot doesn't fill me in. You mean? I think I think I think trying to say so, he. So 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 saying, saying that that mean a lot. You don't don't don't. You can't even knock loose cannon credibility for being from '60s. If if you saying it mean a lot that he said hood business. No, you said it meant a lot. I'm asking you. No, no, what no, that no, 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 no. You said, I said it's laughable. And I said, what that mean? You said a lot. I didn't say nothing. Right, about I just a lot. said it. If 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 you can knock loose cannon credibility, same thing. They grew up in the same bedroom. But they, he, they, him, they, but they, that's, they both, that's all they the both, more reason why he wise not to know what he should be discussing. Oh, he's, not, he's not hood. In regards, so that's why he shouldn't be discussing hood business. If loose cannon took his brother's approach, he wouldn't have all these issues. He wouldn't have all these issues. Y'all yeah. saying different things. What I'm saying. You said it's laughable because he said it's hood business. It's coming from him. He's wise to know he shouldn't be discussing nobody hood business. I said it's laughable because it's coming from him. 
It was wise from him, though. I, I see what Munchie's saying is because it's- I mean, he could act like he understand, but he understand. The fact that I understand don't mean I agree. Good one. I, you ain't gotta agree. That's what I mean. I wasn't saying. I, I wasn't looking for you to tell me I could agree. I said that was a good one. You ain't gotta agree. But here's my one. here's my problem. When when you say something's hood business that has been publicized uh, on on such a magnitude, you almost can't say it's hood business anymore. Hood business is supposed to be stuff that we don't know and that people haven't really talked about publicly. When you ask an individual to confirm something <clears throat> personally, yeah, and he taps out off that. Y'all could discuss it all y'all want, but for me, I'm. I'm gonna leave that where I leave it. Yeah, I think that was wise of him. That that's a wise thing to do. It's laughable coming from him saying hood business. <laughs> hey, you keep I think how laughable it is. And you didn't laugh not once, but I think you're you're attributing loose cannons resume to his brother. Exactly, they're even though they're identical exactly twins. Okay, you know yeah. when they say uh, no credit the same as bad credit. Yeah. Like you like uh, like who 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 is who is he? To say hood, hood business though. Somebody wise enough to know he don't need to be discussing that shit online. We saying two different things. We saying you it's, asked who it's he wise was. not to s discuss certain stuff on the I internet. Think it was. It doesn't wise it's laughable answer. coming from him. It was. A, you can laugh at wisdom all you want. Don't make it any less wise. You, uh, you think you think he uh, uh, he got wisdom? I think it was very wise of him not to. Uh, get you him. don't know him. What you mean? Wisdom? How you know? How you know who I know? Oh, uh, you know. Him? Man, he pulled look up. Look on my platform and see if I know him. He, he's pulled up to the black. I mean, you know a nigga because you interview him? <laughs> All right. You All know right. him? <laughs> I mean, shit. I don't know. Uh, well, I, 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 I believe he made a wise decision. How well do I have to uh, know him okay. to know he made a wise decision? Okay, okay. Spotter say, oh boy, got wisdom or some shit. I say so, he made a wise decision. You just said wisdom. I said it was wise of him. This, this shit recorded, he said wisdom. I use wisdom because it is a derivative of the word wise, but I didn't say he had wisdom in per se. I said I think it was wise of him to make that decision. You know what's crazy? I agree with both of y'all because because you know them niggas is jokes. He didn't want to speak on something. That he didn't want to speak on something. I'm talking but, to Alex. He but know them niggas is but jokes. Munchie is is. I just don't think you get no point calling uh, niggas a joke on the internet for what. Yeah, Munchie's just undermining his. That's my opinion. His gangster, I guess. That's what. That's he, my I opinion. Understand why though? Because what you don't know him either. That's my. I can only go off what I hear on the internet. But you just challenged if that, I knew that, him or not that, with that, a lot that, of authority. I, I don't know the nigga. So how I'm, you gonna speak on a nigga you don't even know? Because I heard clown shit from both of them. Yeah, and they, I mean, and they, and they stories is bunk. Know, well, we hear about, about each other all the time. Not hear what they said. All right. Um, before we move on. All right. <laughs> uh, nah, for real. <laughs> what? Niggas, niggas talking about they lived in the eight trays and they was out there. Niggas ain't got no history like that. Okay, before we move on, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you an update on on Jermaine Williams. Um, I was I was uh, surprised to find out he got arrested in uh, Bakersfield in um, May of 2024 for a burner. He got caught and he's currently in the custody of Kern Current. County, Kern mm -hmm. County, uh, fighting a gun case. And then, uh, I'd say June 17th, after he was in there for about two weeks, uh, two warrants popped up that he had. And the warrants were for, he had uh, count one is forgery. He had another count two for forgery, unauthorized use, identifying information of another, and then grand theft auto. So no the, bail. No bail. And the, the two warrants are out of Kern County. doesn't say what county. But, but Kern County currently wants him for the gun case, but he's got those four other counts in another county on those four other charges, warrants for those four charges. So uh, that's an update on uh, Loose Cannon's brother, identical brother, twin brother. Yes, they're both the same age. He tried to say that, that, that uh, remember, when he's lying about his age. Loose Cannon said he's 30-something, mm -hmm. but his, his twin brother is 40-something. How is that possible, man? I guess he's saying they're not twins. Yeah, he said that uh, he's got another brother or something. But uh, yeah, man, I didn't know. Uh, he's not smart enough to uh, get his age right because then he was an exec way in 2006 and you ran the spider back then and told him all this shit. <laughs> your story's not even matching up with your age. Oh, yeah, he said he produced a song for 50 Cent in 1996 when 50 cent wasn't even out yet mm, crazy and in 96 he would have been like um he was born in 82 so he'd been 14 in 96 producing the music for an artist who wasn't even out i believe he debuted in 99 with um how to rob 
And uh, <laughs> yeah, it, don't, it makes no sense. His timeline is always off. All right. Um, I've never personally encountered a police officer that was slanging drugs in the streets, but I always hear these stories. In almost every division in South LA and in every department in um, county sheriff, there's always that cop that does it. We heard it with Rafael Perez back in '98. Bro had six kilos of cocaine that he took out of the property room. Uh, we've we've always heard these stories, but hey, Munchie, this hits close to home for you because this officer was pulling people over in Inglewood, seizing their drugs, and then stealing drugs out of the property room. Hmm. And then selling them to people on the streets, but dude made a mistake. He wasn't selling them to people on the streets. He was selling them to a CW that mm. was mm -mm -mm. that was tapped into the FBI. And um, let's let's play this clip. At 5.30, a police officer finding himself on the other side of the law, sentenced to time in federal prison after pleading guilty to selling drugs. Well, KCAL News Assignment Editor Mike Rogers at the desk. Mike, you told us when this officer was charged. How long right. will he spend behind bars? So after he reached a plea agreement with the federal prosecutors, he will spend two and a half years in federal prison on allegations that he was selling drugs while on the job. I actually want to come to my computer here because I'm going to show you the federal document uh, where they talk about it. They said specifically their uh, CW, which was a confidential informant to the FBI, said that in 2020 the defendant said he had available for sale a kilo of cocaine that he was willing to sell to this guy. They also said he had two kilos of white China heroin and an unlimited supply of black tar heroin. Now, apparently this officer told this informant that he and his team stole the drugs during a routine traffic stop and that the defendant made as, uh, as a drug task force officer with the Inglewood Police Department. Now, we told you that they did reach a plea agreement and today uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office saying that this former officer, now former officer obviously, will serve two and a half years behind bars uh, in this federal sentence, guys. All right, Mike, thank All you. All right, that's cool. And can you imagine if you, you, you from the streets and, and you got, I don't know, you got a couple of keys in the car, you got several thousand dollars in the car, the cop pulls you over and says, I'm going to take all of this and let you go. You probably going to be like, okay, I'm cool with that because you're either going to go to the penitentiary for 10, 15 years or take the L for 40, 50, 60,000. Which one you going to do? You're going to take the L, right? It depends, right? Because you better hope nobody didn't front you that. Because who gonna believe the police took it and let you go? That's true too. You imagine someone coming to you, they got your work spider, and they come to say, "Hey, man, the police took my shit. They pulled me over and took my shit." You gonna be like, "Hell nah, hmm. I need my money." <laughs> yeah, cold, cold twist. Yeah. yeah, if you're dealing with somebody that's dangerous and hands on, then they, you ain't trouble. But then again. On the other side, then you like, whew, you know what I'm saying? But there's certain people you would believe that from because your relationship and and your closeness uh, would never cross those lines. Like if 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 broke told you, hey, the police pulled me over, they went in my truck, took all the dope, and let me leave. There's probably a few people you would believe that from. Definitely, yeah, very few. Um, well, the officer's name was John Abel Baca, B A C A. He's 48 years old, out of Whittier. And he was a 21-year veteran of the IPD slanging on the streets. That's deep. Man, so he's doing two and a half, and then, you know, they be getting that little six months before you even get that re original release date. And so he go to a halfway house. And, I know a sheriff up off the east side. He was a twin. And he's currently incarcerated in the federal system for getting down in a similar fashion. Hmm. He the one told us, hey, see what's going on. Leave that boy alone. That's Sheriff Baca boy. Oh, you think this guy's related to Baca? No. Oh. Not in particular, but... Because um, he's got the same last name I, as I, Sheriff. I noticed that. Yeah. That's what made me think what I just said. Uh, uh, you know what? That's interesting. I would have thought it might have came up in the story that yeah. Baca's nephew or Lee Baca's right. cousin right. Um, was is, charged with tra trafficking. Is that is is this considered a uh, common last name for Hispanics? It's, um, it's not as common, but... You know the fact that it pops up in law enforcement, all right, and the fact that a dirty police told us leave somebody alone because he baka boy, and now this baka is dirty. You know it might. It's crazy. You know how much money he was selling that kilo for in in Inglewood back in twenty twenty one? Probably way too cheap. 
It says here twenty two thousand. Oh no, nah, that's about, probably about right. Huh? Yeah, but that was twenty two thousand from a uh, Fed. A Fed was the Feds actually bought, bought the cocaine off of him with that Fed money, huh? Yeah, with that Fed money. <laughs> and then he's ordered to pay forty thousand dollars in restitution. So any monies that he made slanging. He's going to have to pay it right back. Plus, he's got to sit in the penitentiary for 30 months. But, yeah, I mean, they hit him on this. But that don't mean he would have yeah. other people he was dumping shit to. He probably got dosed. And we don't know how long he's got away with this. 21 years on the force? I know that's not a new idea, bro. <laughs> yeah, this can't be the your first rodeo, nah, right? 21 nah, years nah. in and you start slanging? Nah, by that time, no, you're too set in your ways one way or the other. You'll take another chance or you too against it to try it. Hmm. But here's one thing, though. He didn't throw any other officers under the bus. He took this case by himself. He obviously didn't admit to nothing else and is able to get away with doing uh, 36, uh, how many months? Um, they said 20 30 years. months. 30 months. Yeah, the crib max sentence. He got 30. And, it's, you know, when, when he first got arrested, the media was like, he's he's facing 20 years in prison. Same thing they said about crib max. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I'm like, damn, this is more than, like, I feel when officers who take that oath and we have an expectation of them of integrity morals honesty you got to do more than 30 months you basically mm-hmm. telling other cops if you get caught mm. they gonna slap you on the wrist you're gonna do a little bit of time but you ain't gonna get stretched out you know police seem they always seem to get a slap on the wrist regardless of what it is bro because imagine a kilo of cocaine. How many people got sentenced to 20 years for a bird or more in L.A.? And the only reason has nothing to do with keeping our people healthy and off drugs is because of the finances we was fucking them over about. It's too, too fast a trip to the hundreds of thousands to the millions. They had to do something about that. But there's, um, there's a guy in the streets of Inglewood that's working for the feds because it, when I read the uh, indictment, it said that somebody informed the FBI that the Inglewood police officer Baca was dirty. So this this didn't come from within the police department. It came from the streets. So someone from the streets informed the FBI, and they said, all right, are you willing to uh, work with us so we can bring him down? That still sounds like an official operation, right? But I think people lose sight of the fact that all law enforcement takes their uniforms off. They all fuck with females. They get drunk. They hit. They people. So information... Travels when people are not out, and then it might turn into some official. But the initial person that told on them might have nothing to do with law enforcement, just misspeaking, talking too much. And what's really an eye opener to me is if he was on the force for 21 years, and it took some confidential informant on the streets of Inglewood to to bring him down. You mean to tell me the Inglewood PD? Did not know that you you have officers out there selling cocaine. How do you how do you keep that from the Inglewood PD? How do you keep that from the chiefs, the assistant chiefs, the sergeants, the lieutenants? That means that y'all is turning a blind eye to officers out there committing crimes. That is definitely a possibility because this wasn't an internal investigation from the IPD that brought him down. This was a street investigation linked up with the FBI that brought him down. IPD was not even a part of this. Hey, um, I know for a fact, and I can name maybe three officers that dealt with the same females that a few of my homies didn't deal with. He could have easily pissed one of them females off and they caught through a tip that way. <laughs> no, nah, for real, for real. But it says here at the bottom of the thing that the Inglewood Police Department provided its full cooperation during the investigation. Mm. So that means the FBI eventually said, hey, we got information on one of your folks. And, of course, they're going to be like, okay, well, what would you like to know? So, I mean, his colleagues perhaps more than likely watched him walk in and out of work for a while knowing they on your ass, boy. Regular day, hi, how you doing? Yeah. Donut, <laughs> coffee. And he had no idea. I'm sure the, the FBI was uh, only let certain – I'm sure the IPD was only on a need to know. Correct. Because mm-hmm. they didn't want it to get out. Hey, they on your ass. Right. And you about to get indicted as soon as you uh, try to sell that bird. Mm. But – um. It's crazy. Uh, the, I always wonder, like, how many more of these, these uh, John Abel Bacas are out there right now? And then when you talk about a bird, that more likely was a soft bird than a hard bird. I believe it was a soft and, bird. And it was hard birds that people was getting all that time for them back in the day, too. And then he's telling, he's telling his sources on the streets, look, I got black tar heroin. I got white China heroin. 
Bro, what did you have? A buffet of 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 Schedule One drugs? Hmm. Probably, like you said, bump somebody up one time, and did a negotiation with him. Like, and now that's probably his plug. So somebody, someone snitched on him. Most likely, someone from the street snitched on him. We'll never know the the true nature of it unless John Abel Baca decides right. to come forward. And say, you know, J John knows everybody that's involved in the case. Right. He knows who told on him. He knows he was selling to. Good. But, uh, hey, man, it's going down in Inglewood. They cleaning up Inglewood for real, for real. Hey, after we hop off, yeah. uh, I, I could show you the receipt that 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 the uh, indict Red Harvey's indictment that they ha had did in Inglewood a week before they came and arrested everybody in 2018. A week before uh, October 30th. A female told me what exactly was going to happen, and it happened. Why? Because she was effing the IPD officer. And, that, and, that, and that's when I said nope. that. Oh, go ahead. That's why I say, in, in this particular officer, I don't even know who know him by name, but I know other ones that mess with our females. I remember when the uh, Front Hood Compton's, they had went down a few years ago, and it was like a major thing. A couple of uh, real popular cats that was out here. It was heavily reported that before they came and raided, uh, it was a, a, a female about the, uh, she was the head of the sheriff's department. I think she got caught on a wiretap, called and give him a heads up, like, hey, they on their way, baby. So the shit do exist. It be in, it be in, the, mm -hmm. be in the mix. Yeah, man, you gotta be careful on these telephones. They Definitely. listening, they listening. Definitely. Mm -hmm. They tapping in, you know, they, they're hearing all our conversations. I don't know if this is, I've heard this rumor once that all our conversations get saved and dumped into a huge cloud f for the powers that be to go back and listen. I've heard similar and, things and, too. Because it's impossible to listen to everybody in live time. So they save everyone's conversations and then go back and listen. I don't know how true that is. I haven't seen anything. I didn't hear that, about the go back and listen part, yeah. but I heard it was uh, possible. Well, check this out. My my T-Mobile only saves my bills for twenty four months mm. because they also have restrictions on saving. Saving costs money. Mm. You know, hard drives cost money. Putting all this data costs money. It it comes out to millions of dollars for corporations. So there's no way I believe that, for example, T-Mobile or AT and T are just saving all our conversations uh, in perpetuity because. What, what's the purpose? Right. Now, uh, is the government doing it some kind of way behind T-Mobile's back or behind AT&T's back? Or does AT&T say, look, we ain't saving the phone calls, but if you want to save the calls, feds, y'all save them. But we ain't going to save them. Because you can't get a bill more that's older than 24 months. Mm. They, they purged the databases at I some imagine point. Imagine the reasons a cat would be looking for a bill older than. You'd be finding out some shit, bro. Why well, would you want a bill older than 24 months? No, because I was trying to, I, I lost a number. Call log. And I was uh, like, okay. I knew it had to be. A I reason. was like, I, I, it's in my bill. I knew it was May 2020. I called this person. Mm. You call and they like, nah, we don't. We only saved the last 24 months. Even you know? have you ever tried to go to the digital version of your? Because you know you can go on your old your own account and look at your own call history. Well, if you log into your, let's say T Mobile or AT and T, because I messed with both of them, you can only go back a certain amount Same of time. Thing. Yeah, okay. I get it. So. This old, whole idea of saving phone calls permanently, forever, uh, it would cost millions and millions of dollars. And I don't think there's any, there's any value in, what, 300 million Americans with cell phones and y'all yeah. saving all our conversations? It right. sounds crazy. Right. But, you know, hmm. I don't know. It's if you think about the, the way they're trying to build up the AI, if they're using it, the information for something like that, to have a totality of everybody's thoughts, information to go into the AI monster, that might make a little more sense. Well, I do think that maybe the FBI has a list of gangsters that they want to monitor. Definitely. And and they tell T-Mobile or AT&T or whoever, uh, we want to save all of those conversations just for, for investigative purposes. There's no warrant. They can't pull it out in court. But they'll certainly find out what you're doing. And then when you're wondering, like, hey, why did police pop up at this meeting? Right. You know. You'll never know. You'll never know. Yeah. You know, because it, there was no warrant issued for you right. to for all this monitoring. And that was COINTELPRO. COINTELPRO in the seven, in the 60s and 70s, there was no warrants. They were just monitoring people. Mm. You know, I'm, I'm glad they, they got rid of that program in, uh, in the 70s. But 
I'm sure they got a new version. They do because I've been notified in past tense that through, well, they may have gotten a warrant though, so I don't know if they secured a warrant. Yeah, yeah. If they notified you that your phone or you was on a call, a tap call. Yeah, judge, yeah. judge signed off on that okay. and did it, did it the legit way. Yeah, if they sent you that letter letting you know that they was listening, then they, they did it the real deal way. Yeah, but you know, if if the U.S. government can go into Pakistan and kill Osama bin Laden without letting the Pakistani government know that this is what they wanted to do and get there and do it and piss off the Pakistani government, get in there and get out without a scratch, you know, they're capable of all kind of monitoring. You know, they tracked down, and, and, and Osama bin Laden didn't use cell phones, didn't have the internet. He had a nice villa that was off the grid, but somebody ratted him out. You know, this is his location, and they went there and got his ass. I wonder how much it was worth to him. Hey, when that happened, there was someone on Twitter that lived in the same neighborhood as uh, Osama bin Laden, and he tweeted, there's a bunch of helicopters flying over me right now. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> and live, he tweeted that. Did you ever see the Joe Budden interview with the white dude who went and got the kill? One of the dudes? I, I didn't I didn't watch it, no. That's a, that's a good interview, bro. That dude is... It's intense just to hear his story, how graphic, the details. Shit you wouldn't imagine to hear this dude telling his story, how they went in there. They even had a malfunction. Like, they didn't think they was going to get out of there right. But it's a real, that's a great uh, listen, that interview. And the technology that that was available when Obama did that is there, there's a photo of Hillary Clinton and a whole bunch of people in, in the government. They're watching them do it live. Mm -hmm. And you see them in front of the screen, mm -hmm. and you just see all this tension on there. They're watching them kill Osama bin Laden. Like what, ten thousand miles away? This operation's going on, and they're watching it in live, you know, in their offices. I don't even know if the stuff like that uh, is done. They got met too with resistance, going up a stairwell. Like his son came down with chopper. They had to knock some shit down. You got, you got to watch that interview, bro. That's a hard ass interview. And then they they buried him in the sea. Yeah, they wrapped him up in some white cloth and buried him in the sea. But all right, man, we're going to wrap this up. That's another episode of Straight Politicking. Uh, make sure you tap in with all our Instagrams. They're in the show notes below. And we out.